Well, awesome. Thanks everyone for being here today. We're going to jump right in. Uh, Desiree and I were just talking about coffee and uh, all things that help us get through the day. Um, so yeah, grab a cup of coffee, grab a cup of tea or your favorite beverage. We're going to be diving into ransomware and backup strategies today. So thanks for being here. Um, before we jump into the content, we got a lot to go through, but I kind of wanted to go through a couple just uh, kind of framing the conversation today around who is this webinar for? That way, if you want to grab in a colleague or maybe you want to share this webinar after the event uh, with other members of your team, but really we've designed this content for any organization that stores sensitive data, law firms, financial firms, medical organizations that want to learn how to protect their data better. And um, really all organizations that, that store data, really any organization has, has some sort of cybersecurity risk. Um, but ultimately the organizations that have more sensitive data, a little industry term PII, personal identifiable information, if you've seen that word around, basically means industries that hold uh, or any, any type of data that's um, sensitive, that credit card information, addresses, full names, email addresses, um, social security numbers, things like that. If your organization stores those, you're going to be uh, targeted more than other organizations for ransomware and things like that. Um, and you also may have compliance related needs. So a lot of the content we're going to be talking about today are going to be kind of focused on those types of organizations. But these best practices and the things Desiree and I are going to talk about today are all going to be things that are applicable across um, all sorts of industries. The next thing we're going to dive into is um, organizations that uh, want to learn about what current cybersecurity threats are to their organization. So really, what are um, kind of the, the most common threats we're seeing, whether it's ransomware or malware, or social engineered attacks, things like that will be going through kind of the, the current state of affairs when it comes to specific uh, types of uh, attacks. Um, organizations are experiencing. And then we'll also be talking about compliance friendly data management decisions. So this kind of ties in with organizations that have regulatory needs, we're going to be talking about, hey, uh, what type of backup strategies, what type of uh, tools and and solutions you can put in to make sure you're not only putting the best practices cybersecurity wise in, but then also uh, making sure you're compliant with any regulatory organizations. Awesome. Um, love to introduce us. Uh, my name is Taylor Wells. I'm the director of marketing with Northwest Technologies Group. Um, if you've been on one of our webinars before, welcome back. Thanks for thanks for tuning in again. Uh, we host monthly webinars on all sorts of uh, technology challenges um, small and medium sized organizations are experiencing, whether it's cybersecurity, whether it's uh, phone systems, um, uh, communi other communication challenges. We kind of cover all of them. So you can check out our website to watch other webinars. Um, and thanks for coming back if this is uh, a second or third uh, webinar you've attended. I also have the great privilege of being with Desiree Tom Thompson from Datto. Datto um, is a uh, partner of ours that helps us with backup strategies. And they, they kind of work behind the scenes. You probably haven't seen their name um, out and about, but they work behind the scenes of uh, supporting organizations like ours, MSPs, which is uh, the type of organization we are, to help us service our clients and give up, give the best backup solutions for our clients. Um, a couple of housekeeping items uh, before we jump into the content. We will be recording the, the webinar, so expect an email from us in the next 24 hours or so um, to rewatch the webinar. If you're not able to stay for the whole thing, or uh, if you want to rewatch it, we're going to be going through. Um, Desiree has an has a awesome pack full uh, uh, deck and, and presentation she's going to take us through. Um, so if you want a copy of that presentation, you can also ask for that as well. Um, and a copy of the recording as well will be sent out in the next 24 hours. If you have questions, please submit them through the Q&A. Uh, we'll try to answer your questions throughout the event and try to uh, position our, our content to uh, your questions. We've also, we also submitted questions in advance. So we've reviewed those and make sure we, we cover those in the presentation. So thank you for submitting those, those questions. Last but not least, we're gonna be going through a lot of content. So if you uh, have questions, we're a resource. You can ask um, us, NW Techs, um, to, to explain anything after this webinar. Um, and we will have actionable uh, uh, items you can take to get more help and for us to uh, be able to implement some of these strategies for you. Fantastic. Well, without further ado, I'm going to uh, pass it off to Desiree. Desiree is going to take us through a presentation that we're going to be talking through um, ransomware and, and backup strategies. 
So Desiree, thanks so much for being here and, and take us away. Thank you so much. Um, so to introduce myself, Desiree, uh, I'm coming to you from good old Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Um, and my position at Dado is as a channel development manager, which usually means I can do presentations like this in real life over cocktails or breakfast or lunch or all the amazing restaurants you guys have in the US that I miss so much. <laughs> and now instead I get to sit in Calgary in the middle of winter and do these presentations. <laughs> and you guys can make fun of my Canadianisms because apparently I've been home too long and now I just sound all too much of a Canadian. Um, so as Taylor was saying, exactly right, you, chances are you've never heard of Dado as a company. Um, and that isn't because we aren't a big company. We've been around since 2007. We came from an at-home basement. Our whole founder, CEO, he got out of school and then realized that he didn't have enough experience um, to get a job. So I thought, well, create something so that would be enough experience to create a job. And that was apparently a really good idea. So it's, that grew quite drastically to over 23 offices around the world with um, industries like yourself, over 700 SMB industries protected by our solutions. And then I want to talk about who are the threats. So like Taylor was saying, we talk about ransomware, we talk about the bad guys and all of these things, but who are they actually? And to break that down, I wanted to break it into three different buckets. So we talk about compromised identity first. What is compromised identity? Well, think about your information that you have in your life and who you are has value. So you might work for a bank and have logins to that bank, and then that you might have access to the network or something along the lines. So if someone steals that information, they can use it to either sell it and give it to someone else, or they can use it to use the same access that you have to steal information from your business. Um, compromised identity and compromised access fall into those same kind of buckets. If they can impersonate you to either use your information to either sell it or to steal someone else's information or gain access from somebody else. So we see that across the board, whether it be um, old school dumpster diving or you now see the phone scams you hear all the time, especially during tax season this time of year, or phishing campaigns, you hear those words all the time. And then ransomware, that new shiny thing that definitely in the last five or six years, especially in the last 12 to 16 months of our lives has increased so drastically. Think about ransomware this way. It create your computer, you get into your computer one day, you click something, just unfortunate, it happens, and all of your files are encrypted. You get this red screen of death that says, here, this is how you pay us. But besides that, all your information is encrypted. And then the thing what's scary, uh, most scariest about ransomware is even if you pay the bad guys, there's a lot of ransom groups out there that won't even give your information back. Or they take that information and they still sell it on the dark web because they still have access to it and it's still valuable and worth something. And we're seeing that across the board. Um, just pretty recently, we were seeing ransomware attacks hitting three foot law firms in 24 hours. Um, and we see that almost on a day-to-day -day basis that different businesses are getting hit. So who are these bad guys? Um, who are the bad guys? I remember when I was a teenager, I always thought it was going to be me and Angelina um, in the movie Hackers. And I was just to be a hacker, all I needed to do is have a hoodie and a really good set of rollerblades. And I was totally set, right? Um, we've seen how Hacking the groups of hacking company or businesses, because this is a business, don't fool ourselves, increase throughout the years. Um, start, you start with hacking collectives. So those bad guys, a lot of um, the bad guys who went to jail, they went to prison, and then now they're coming back and they're white hack hackers. Or maybe they're just people who are just curious to see what they can do to break into things. They want to test the security, and then they realize there's a good business in that. Um, IoT, especially nowadays, you have to think about your IoT devices, um, thinking about your Nest or your OK Google or any of those machines that are connected to the network. When you're at home, when your staff are at home, how are those devices connected? Are they connected to the same device, same way that your computers and all your programs are connected in that home environment? Um, of course, ransomware developers, nation state, fortunately, there's countries around the world that don't like the US or Canada and wanna to try to steal as much information from us as possible. The organized crime, the bad guys are always gonna want a piece of the pie if there's money to be made. And then I just like to point out insider threats because that's a huge risk you see within your business. And it doesn't matter who you are. And it doesn't even have to be like massive, massive um, examples of insider threats. But think about if you have a sales team that has a full book of business and they have just been offered a position for double the money in another company and they think they can take their book of business with them. That's an example of an insider threat that's trying to steal information from your business and give it to somebody else either to use it or to sell it. 
Um, I want to show some interesting statistics. I like statistics. I find them well, interesting for them to say. 43% uh, of cyber attacks were aimed at small to medium sized businesses. That's pretty sombering if you think this is you guys. If the reason why is because there's a lot of small to medium sized businesses and you have a lot of information and that information is valuable. 85% of all email attachments are harmful. I always think about the HR person, that poor HR person that has to go over and gets maybe 100 emails, 200 emails, they're doing a hiring spree and they have so many things. If 85% of email attachments are harmful, I feel really bad for that HR person and then the potential threat opening all of those emails. 91% of attacks are launched from a phishing campaign. So someone trying to pretend to be you um, or someone trying to pretend to be someone else to try to get access information from you. Uh, cybercrime will cost six trillion by 2021. We will definitely see that number, and especially after 2020, what we saw that number skyrocket quite drastically. Uh, I love the statistics because I never even knew that 24 uh, new apps were actually in the App Store daily, let alone the fact that there's 24,000 new malicious apps removed from the App Store daily. Um, and then really just a point to hit home. Um, when you're thinking, when we're going over the next steps and you're thinking about this and you're having these conversations within your business, recognizing the fact that a business is hit with ransomware every 13 seconds. So it's no longer uh, the if, okay, maybe this will happen to me, it will happen. Chances are you have emails already in your bin that it already has happened. Maybe you were just lucky enough not to click those. Um, so it's really, really important that when you're going through this, that you have policies and procedures in place. I just went over a whole bunch of really scary things. <laughs> Hopefully you're not shaking in your seats too much, but I have some tips and tricks that you can take away right from this event, from this webinar, just to make your businesses more secure. First, always remember that you are a target online and offline. And like I said, do not say it's not going to happen to you because it will. Even the best of the best, an example here of a cybersecurity security expert who got hacked, that's literally his job is to say, hey, these are the safety things you need to have in place. These are the threats. And he got hacked. Um, policies and procedures, especially in this work from anywhere world, look at where your staff are. Do you know where their routers are from? Do you know how they're connected? Do you know who's using what computers? Do you know if they're password protecting? So many different things. And you need to make sure that you have the policies, procedures in place, not only to train your staff, but to keep your business protected. And if you're not sure how to set that up, talk to Northwest, they'll be able to help you out. Some examples of reasons why this is so important, just some news articles. There were some routers that were exclusively sold from uh, Walmart and Amazon that actually had backdoors hidden in them. This is a well-known fact. These are news articles that are hitting and these are products that everybody's buying. Um, ongoing employee training. It's not good enough that soon as your staff come on board and day one, you sit them down in that room with the video and the office and the book, that's not good enough anymore. You have to constantly be training your staff. A good example of that is this guy in Hawaii. Um, this is the guy who does all of the alerting in Hawaii. And he's like, you, this is his LinkedIn profile. You can tell he's excited. He loves his job. If anything bad happens in Hawaii, he's the one who's going to let everyone know. And there on his computer, on his LinkedIn profile, is a login and his password to his computer. So he's security focused. Once again, that's why employee training con consistently is super important. Password management. Um, I can't say this enough. You need to have at bare, bare minimum, do not use the same passwords on your social as your business accounts. You shouldn't have the same password more than once. I understand that that's a step up, but the bare minimum, do not use the same passwords on social and business. Um, yeah, so right. yes. I'll jump in here. Just wanted to elaborate on I that. Nine times out of 10, when I talk to a small business or an organization, they don't have a password manager in place. And if anything you take out of this event, um, implementing a password manager is so crucial. I think it saves me like 15 minutes a day, just, just saving time, right? I don't have to reset passwords. And then so much of uh, compromises, and I'm sure you'll get to it, happen due to the fact that people reusing passwords across multiple sites not, you know, using many times when I talk to an organization, they have a password list sheet, right? An Excel spreadsheet that they're emailing across their organization. Uh, multiple, multiple issues with that and multiple areas that can compromise your organization. So it's one of, yeah, our perspective is we see this a lot where organizations don't have password managers. And not only does it exponentially increase your security, but it saves your time, or it saves your organization time and saves your team members time from having to reset passwords, having to share passwords. Um, so yeah, great, great thought there.
Yeah, when I talk about password managers, and I always I always have this conversation, like use these statistics, and I talk these things. The fact of the matter is, once you use a password manager, your life is so much easier that it always shocks me how long it takes people to start using them because no one uses it and is like, oh, I wish I did. I wish I had to write them all down again like that. <laughs> no one ever goes backwards. Totally. So it is maybe the most annoying thing to get set up. This is where you guys can help. Definitely. But getting set up, picking the right one can be annoying. But having it can save so much time and then the stress even our CISO within our company um, our security officer he will firmly state and he has several times that if business has had a password manager and we're using unique passwords mm. and then using 2FA mm. that would fix half the issues mm. that are out there um, a lot of these attacks these phishing tech a lot of these things that are happening are happening where if those simple things were in place that they are less there's be less risk uh, across the board can you, to work with ransomware but yeah can you elaborate on 2fa and how that works with password managers just for our audience if they don't know because it's yeah, a super absolutely. sweet super sweet integration that and i'd love for you to elaborate on that yeah i'd love to um and then but i'm gonna also you're gonna have to make fun of me because i can't say authentication there right, i did it all right all right okay so, you did it good job <laughs> yeah so 2fa or two-factor authentication sorry um mm -hmm. or multi-factor authentication it uh, it's a so you ever pick up your phone and then you get a like say you log into your emails and you get a prompt and it says you got to press on your phone this button that's an example of 2fa so mm -hmm. you should have this across any like your email um we have it on our uh like salesforce accounts or any of those accounts where you're holding data in it and what that essentially does is if somebody was to fake your account someone has to fake your email account and then they open it up well if they're going to get the 2fa and that 2fa is going right or that prompt that goes to your phone and says hey did you actually mean to log into this and if you're not logged into it then you instantly know i didn't mean to and that's when you talk to the security person in your business and your, or your tech person and say hey i didn't log into this i think there's something wrong with my account and that's the reason why it stops so many things to happen is because it goes onto your phone and it takes them a lot more effort to spoof that then it does for them to do a mass blanket, go and try to get logged into everybody's emails. And then anybody who doesn't have 2FA, well, they're already in, everybody else just falls off. They don't need to do that again. They already, so then they take the, these are the, what do they call it? Low hanging fruit. Yeah. The bad guys also want to go for the low hanging fruit. So definitely the low hanging fruit. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> and then the password manager is so cool because you can integrate your, your 2FA um, into it. So you, for example, if you share a login, uh, with with another team member and it has MFA enabled on it, you can have that in the password manager. So you don't have to you don't have to have your boss, or your coworker reach out to you be like, hey, what's the text message? What's the code? You know, it's built into the password manager. So you have that password and the 2FA all in there. Um, and yeah, will greatly increase your security uh, and efficiency in your organization. Um, and kind of, I think all of these things, you know, we're going, we're kind of going through a lot of different cybersecurity uh, features and or solutions, and they all, they all kind of bolster up your overall security. And it may not be directly tied to ransomware, but it could have a string, uh, a chain reaction, right? If people get access to one account, um, it may have a string reaction. So having, you're bolstering up your security in all your areas will only help you uh, combat ransomware and other cyber crimes. So love it. Um, awesome. So never leave devices unattended. This is another big one. Uh, and then there definitely when I travel 70% of the time and on airplanes all the time, I, I usually reference the fact that at airports, the number of times or lobby bars or Starbucks, the number of times you see someone can just leave their computer open because they're running mm -hmm. to grab sugar or coffee or a drink or whatnot. And then nowadays you think, okay, well, you're a lot safer because you're at home, but you have to think about who is in your house and not that they're trying to steal stuff from you. Hopefully that's not the goal, but thinking about, okay, your kids, there's a lot of houses that their families might not have a home computer and a work computer. So if you're doing the, your staff are working from home, there's a good chance their kids are on their computers. Um, do you have a policy of with that, that the kids are allowed to be on computers? Um, or do they know what they're touching? Do you know what they're accessing? Which goes hand in hand with the being careful you click. If you don't have a policy within your business that a staff computer is one person's computer, then somebody else can be using that and you 
don't know what they're clicking. Um, and there's some really examples of that we see across, especially this time of year, you see the, the, the banking scams where they drain your banking accounts or the scams where someone has been, sends you an email and says, I have access to your video camera for the last however long. And I have so many videos of you doing everything. Uh, and those can be really, really scary. Um, or during tax season, we've seen that, um, and I always like to point this out and make sure that even when you're watching this, that you pay attention and you think about this, that during tax times, those phone calls or those emails that go out that say from the CRA or the US, I don't know what the US version of that would be, but for us, it's the CRA. And you get a note saying, if, or a phone call being like, if you don't pay us, we're sending you to jail because you owe us money now. Um, and you might not, think right now, like watching this, you might not be like, oh, I would never, ever do that. Talk to the people in your life and make sure they wouldn't either. I've personally had two friends, parents who lost their uh, like thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars up to one person lost $50,000, which is a huge chunk of money at that time of life, um, which is a big part of a retirement fund because of one of these scams. So that's another point that thank you for attending these events, but make sure you're spreading this information and helping new people around you be secure as well. Antivirus and malware protection, super important, as always. Um, if, if you have any questions, Northwest can help you out. Mobile device policy, I talked about laptops, but even phones. How many times have you gone somewhere and you either yourself or you've watched someone do it where the cell phone the, goes into the kids' hands to entertain them while you guys are hanging out? Um, I see that with friends and families all the time. And I, to like, I understand that. It, it totally makes sense. But what are they clicking? especially when his phone is open. Do you have policies on emails that you only the person who sees them can open it? Are the kids just clicking and open emails and pressing buttons? And those are chances they're going to click things that you're not sure about. Um, security testing and configuration. So on with employee training, it's not enough to do that once in a while. Test your staff. Um, I get emails randomly all the time that says you need to click this, you need to update your uh, this account or this account. Those are examples of emails that um, my company will send out to us to make sure that that training sticks. And if I click that email, it goes, I get called out on it and I get, hey, your training, we're going to put you back in it because you clicked an email and that email was would have been ransomware had it been a real um, ransomware attack, but luckily it was a test. I've never gone through that, partly because I never opened any of my emails, but <laughs> also not a good way to do Yeah, I know. My boss doesn't agree so for some reason. I'm really confused. <laughs> <laughs> always remember that everyone has a plan until you get punched in the face so we've got a lot of things to protect you and then i could not do my job if i didn't talk about backups and then changing that expectation around what backing up your information actually is and talk more about um your business continuity plan uh and to talk about that let's just i'm going to talk about um, rpo and rto a couple times in the next little few minutes here but talking about what this means. So when you're talking about recovery, um, your RPO, so your recovery point objective, that's how often you're backing up information. So within your business, if you were only backing up your information once a week, and then you went down, you could lose potentially once a week, one to seven days of information. And maybe that's okay for your business. Or say, if you're a university professor and you're backing up your information that often and then you're grading papers, well, they're gonna lose a lot of information and a lot of time that you've put into grading a bunch of papers. Um, where if you're backing up that information every hour, you only lose up to an hour of work. So that makes it a lot more, um, a lot easier if something's happened to go back. Then we talk about RTO, your recovery time objective. So when something happens, how much downtime will your business have? So going back to the university professor, say if they're, they're super smart, super intelligent, they're backing up their information once an hour because they really don't want something bad to happen and don't have to redo all that work. But then it takes them three weeks to get back up and running when that disaster happens. So on the other hand of that is how long will it take you to go back up and running if there was a flood or a fire or if a kid came into your uh, or your dogs, I know my dogs have done this, come up and knock your computer on the floor. Can you be back up and running within minutes or is it going to take you two weeks or oh, three weeks a month? Um, and what we're going to talk about this is um, 
I'll actually give you a, a questionnaire you can go through at any point in time that you can actually see what your recovery point objective is. Um, and the, but the reason why that's important is because ransomware is running rapid. We already talked about so many of the statistics, so many of the news, but even just realizing that the total ransom that's actually paid by SMB, um, 700 plus uh, million. But I want you to think about that number. That number is actually the amount the FBI knows about. So this is the amount that a small to medium sized business got hit with ransom, paid it, and then called the FBI and said, hey, P.S., I paid the bad guys this amount of money. I can guarantee you not everybody calls the FBI and does that. So the number is very, very drastically. And that number doesn't include that actual cost of downtime. Let me talk about like, how are we seeing increases of attacks? Who is getting hit? Um, even just, I pulled this slide from last month, I think it was, um, law firms, courts, legal aid, legal services. You're seeing so many businesses get hit with ransomware and then it doesn't matter the size of the industry either. Uh, so it doesn't matter if you're a business with two staff or say maybe you're a business with 100, 500 plus staff, your business is going to be affected because they back the matter is your business is worth money to the bad guys. You guys wanna make money, they wanna make money. Um, unfortunately, they're doing a really good job. Uh, and then I'll just bring up some statistics. We see it or some slides. We see it in the news uh, every single day. You're seeing different articles happen. And then an important article that I just wanted to point out here came out on October 1st of 2020. And this is when the U.S. government actually sat down and said, hey, when you pay the bad guys and you pay the ransomware and you pay the dark web, you are funding the worst of the worst. Those bad guys are not using the money necessarily, who knows, to buy ice cream but they're probably buying really horrible ice cream, but they're doing, they're funding it for really horrible things. And so the U.S. government actually said that, hey, if you pay ransomware, you might actually face sanctions against the U.S. government. Um, so that's something really important to notice. They're starting to take uh, into account that they don't want you to pay the bad guys and that you need to have plans in place. That way you don't have to, to protect your business. So we covered a lot of scary things. How do you protect your business from all of this? And this is where we start talking about our business continuity solution and stop thinking about uh, backup actually the way it is. So today, can you say where your backup is and how you're backing it up? Maybe you're backing it up only on cloud. Maybe you're backing it up on tape. When was the last time you checked that tape? Where is the tape? Or maybe you just have a file-based backup. These are all solutions that are backup but this is not a business continuity solution. So while it might work, what if it takes you with your backup two weeks to get back to the point where you're starting working? So this is why we talk about business continuity and what continuity is having your hybrid image, your hybrid cloud image based backup, um, your, sorry, your hybrid cloud based backup and your image based backup. So literally if I was to take my computer and smash it right now, I could go over to my husband's computer and work from him his seamlessly. Everything would be set up exactly the way I needed. And even say this presentation, I could literally pull up this presentation exactly where I am and continue going. Um, the point of this is delivering that superior RTO and RPO. So you are backed up is quickly going back to the moment where before the incident happened and you're able to be back up and running as quickly as possible, eliminating all your downtime. And then with virtualization, you're able to use that computer anywhere at any point in time. But that's not it. We also include ransomware detection. That's like the extra on the infomercial, like, but now, um, but ransomware detection. And this is a really big thing. And this is one of our, um, our features that Anytime I have these conversations, especially when we talk about ransomware being so scary, it can be really relieving and just helping you guys sleep at night. Uh, without going into a huge amount of detail, just knowing that it works, but what this means, what it actually does is every time we back up, so say if you're that university professor and you're backing up every hour, there's an image that's actually taken and there's a screenshot verification saying, hey, this backup is, vi is, uh, is viable, it works, everything's good with it. And then it takes another backup, another hour. And if that second backup all of a sudden, hey, there's a massive difference in between these two, we think there's a potential that there was actually ransomware downloaded sometime in that last hour. Well, hold, everyone stop, hold it up. Let's roll back to that previous version. So you only lost an hour of work. And then the, your MSP Northwest is gonna reach out to you and say, hey, we noticed there was a huge problem. No stress, we're fixing it for you right now. 
Um, so this is a really, really important thing that will help your guys' businesses really just sleep at night. You have enough stressors with everything else going on. You don't have to worry about this. So we understand that we have to start, we have to stop thinking about back, uh, backup and we need to start thinking about business continuity. So we couldn't do this presentation without talking about Google Workspace and Microsoft Office 365. Are you backing those up? Well, why? Why would you even need to? Some statistics to tie that. Let's talk about how SaaS data, data is actually compromised. And these statistics aren't too scary if you think about it, but remembering every one of these statistics means your emails, all of those systems are gone. If your systems just disappeared right now, your, your Gmail, if that was just gone right now, or I can guarantee you projects like this are done on things like a G Suite. If this was just gone, could you still do your presentation? Chances are no, but only 7% of data loss is caused by malicious deletions. So thinking about those staff that are doing things on purpose or trying to be bad or something along the lines, or you think 30% of data loss is caused by viruses or hackers, 13. That number is increasing quite drastically. We've seen something called Ransom Cloud, which we can send you a video if you're ever interested. Um, Ransom Cloud is super interesting. It's ransomware that you, as a bad guy, you can buy you put in people's emails and you just send it to them. And then whoever clicks, you now get a payday if they want their information back. Um, so that is increasing, but still 13% considering the statistics we've seen isn't too bad. And then you think of 47% of data loss is caused by end user deletions. That's not the bad guys. That's people being nice. That's me walking into a job and realizing that no one's organized anything for so long that everything's a disaster. So I start deleting things to help organize. Or you might have someone in your office who comes in and they get the notification that they're at 100% instead of asking for more, they just start deleting things. Let me look at how the thresholds of information being helped. With um, Microsoft specifically, majority of products, majority of things that are deleted, you don't notice they're deleted until 140 days out, which depending on what it is, say your inbox folder, isn't a big deal because 45 days or 140 days out, you still can actually actually act or go back to this information. But you go into your deleted folders, that's gone. You go into your auto archive, that's gone. A lot of these are now permanently deleted. And if you need to access that information, it's gone. And then we look at the shared responsibility models. Um, I'm gonna talk about Google and Microsoft a, a little bit more in a second here, but just pointing out the shared responsibility. What is Microsoft actually responsible for? And they state they're responsible for, there's things inside. So hardware, software, natural disasters, power outages. So anything within the application where you or your managed service provider is responsible for backing up things like human error, program errors, malicious insiders, external hackers, so those bad guys again, or viruses or malware, or that Susie or Bob, who's just helping organize and deleting things. If you don't have it backed up already and it's gone, it's gone. And then talk about their SLA. So you remember those paperwork that you always the contracts you sign on the bottom and you promise you read the fine print. And I don't know about you, Taylor, but I don't know how many times I've never read the fine print. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no one ever reads it. <laughs> exactly. But so in their fine print, they actually state in their SLAs that you are responsible for backing up your inf their information. They want you, they're not responsible for it. If it's gone, it's gone. And they want you to actually use a third party. So they recommend you back up your information and your content regularly, and they recommend you use a third party. So they're already telling you in the paperwork you already agreed to sign to do it. And this is where data SaaS protection comes into place. It doesn't matter who you are. It's unlimited storage. It's super, super easy for Tyler to set it up for you guys. And if you're a two-person shop or going all the way to scale to enterprise at maybe 500 employees, this solution will be quick and easy for to set up. And it's going to protect you from those 47% of deletions that are even just accidental. So I promised I'd talk more about RPO and RTO. We've already talked about how often you're backing up your information and hopefully you're thinking about within your business, how often do you need to back things up? And then how quickly can you be back up and running? If you're not sure what that answer would actually be, what would your hourly cost to your downtime would be? Taylor can sit with you and you can go over this recovery downtime cal calculator. I love this calculator because 
I just think education is good. It's, you know, especially as a business owner yourselves, you've got to be able to think being like, okay, if it costs my business $5 an hour to be down, but it's $20 an hour to buy a product, well, I guess maybe I'll risk it. If it costs your business $5,000 to be down and $20, twenty dollars isn't the number, I'm just as an example, what are you going to pay? With this, with this questionnaire, it's a simple 10 questions, six current data questions, four state of the business questions. We'll walk you through it. And then at the end of it, you'll actually be able to see what your current cost of downtime would be in comparable to using a solution and using your managed service providers um, products. So we covered a ton of information. I'm just going to go over those quick tips and tricks one more time in case you didn't write them down. This recording is available. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Always remember you're a target online and offline. Don't say it'll never happen to you. Have policies and procedures in place. If you're not sure how to set those up within your business, especially in this work from anywhere world, talk to Northwest. They'll be able to walk you through that. Ongoing employee training. Always test your staff. Make sure they're test them trial them out and see if maybe they're going to click something, maybe like make it a competition. Um, password management, we talked about it. Taylor and I went back and forth on this one a little bit. You really want to use a password manager. I promise, although it might seem on the front end, like it's irritating and difficult to set one up. Um, once you have it set up, it's going to save you so much time and stress on a day-to-day -day basis. It's huge. Never to leave your devices unattended, even in this work from any word world. Make sure your staff understand who's accessing what in their houses. Um, what are their kids' games playing on? Um, are they on TikTok on the same network? What security risks are the houses being opened up to in this work from anywhere world? Be careful what you click. Antivirus and malware protection, super important. Backups, business continuity. Make sure you understand what the cost of downtime would be in your business so you can have that um, educated decision. Mobile device policy, making sure that people have 2FA on their phone, that they have locks on their phone, and that their kids are able to access anything on their phone. Security testing and configurations. And with that, I say thank you so much. You're headed in the right direction. Um, thank you all for joining. Thanks, so Desiree. Super great. Yeah, we have a couple questions that came in that I'd love to, to address. And um, before we do that, this high level overview, um, we kind of point, we kind of uh, went through a bunch of options uh, for preventative measures, right? So whether it's policies and procedures, password managers, um, there's a lot of preventative things you can do. But ultimately, the cyber criminals are always usually one step ahead of us, right? They're always thinking the what ifs, they're always thinking of the new ways to get into your organization. So that's why we have to be reliant on backups, right? And SaaS backups, so cloud, cloud-based backups are something, once again, when I talk to an organization or we work with uh, prospective clients, um, nine times out of 10, they don't even know they need to back up the cloud, right? They don't even know they need to back up uh, their files or their emails. Um, so big picture, ultimately, uh, preventative measures, right? There's lots of preventative measures you can do, but then you need to have those backups in place, whether it's desktops, servers, but then also the cloud as well. Awesome. We have a couple of good questions that came in here. Uh, John asks, and I think this would be a good one, Desiree, if you want to jump on this one. J John asks, um, doesn't most uh, ransomware lurk on computers for a few days before um, launching the program? Uh, doesn't this corrupt your backups too? So that's where we have the immutable cloud. I love that I know that word. Um, and I had to look it up several times before it was ever said to me. But with our data solution, and John, you're right, that does happen. It has happened with competitors. We've seen it in the news. Um, with data solution, with our immutable cloud, it makes our cloud ransomware resilient. Of course, we can't scale on the rooftops and say, PS all, bad guys, we, you're completely backups, completely protecting. You can never ever access us because you never ever want to say that. But it is what it happens with our immutable cloud is that each backup is completely independent and they're located in different locations. And the you can't actually delete any of them. So even, even as an MSP, you have to go through, or you guys would have to go through so many steps to actually delete any of the information that the bad guys can't go through those steps. Um, even if they were to delete anything, it still is completely backed up the way it was. Uh, and so even if they were to go at any other steps, there's still the extra ones that they can't get into at all. Love it. Yeah. So what I heard was basically uh, there's a there's a single backup that's really hard to get to, but there's also it's also redundancy. So there's another backup 
So multiple layers that they have to go through and MSP, us being the IT provider, we don't even have access managing your IT infrastructure to even get to those levels of backups. That's yeah. great. Awesome. Another question came through is uh, what uh, password managers would you recommend? Um, and Hannah and Thomas both send in this question. And uh, personally, I love 1Password. I think 1Password is an awesome solution. We use it internally for our company. We implement it across a lot of our clients. LastPass is also another great solution. It's kind of a number two um, on our list. Um, there's a lot of great solutions out there. Ultimately, um, I think LastPass or 1Password are the most affordable. 1Password um, seems to be the most user-friendly. Um, it's just, it's just in intuitive. Um, I believe Apple actually purchased, or they didn't purchase, but they've, they've implemented 1Password across all of their employees. Um, and um, just because of the ease of use and how easy it, and how easy it works. Um, that being said, it can be like, as I mentioned, it can be a little bit cumbersome implementing a password manager. So getting your IT provider or somebody like us to help you implement it uh, can be super helpful. Um, another question that came through here is, uh, is, Ma is Microsoft antivirus or security suites uh, not helpful when it comes to uh, backups and, and whatnot? Desiree, do you have any experience with, uh, with that question? I can um, take a look at that perspective. Uh, I think I would, I would push back on you. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. So the Microsoft antivirus and the security suite in general, from my perspective is, yes, that's going to help you uh, with your general cybersecurity uh, and protecting either your workstation or the cloud. Um, and Microsoft 365, we love it. We implement it for a lot of our clients. We use it internally because they do have a robust set of security features um, and notifications. Like for example, uh, about a month ago, we had somebody from um, Eastern Europe trying to access my email address. And one of our head engineers got a notification through the Microsoft security portal that said, hey, somebody's trying to access from, from Eastern Europe uh, your, your email. Uh, maybe you should reset your password. And he actually went in and added some extra security features to my specific OneDrive and SharePoint and, and email. That way, um, you know, if there was somebody trying to maliciously trying to get into my account, they wouldn't be able to. That being said, um, nothing's 100%, right? So that's where backups come in. We can we can do all the things, and we've seen, um, especially policies and procedures, antivirus, password managers, um, ongoing training, uh, simulated phishing training, or ongoing education for clients are all things that are going to get you exponentially more secure. That being said. Um, uh, nothing's hundred percent. So that's where backups need to come in, um, and help you there. Fantastic. Well, I think we answered all the questions that came through and thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, if anyone has any questions around, um, our service and, or, uh, any, any sort of questions around how we can help you implement these tools, um, you can actually go to our website, nwtext.com and schedule a free one-on-one -on -one 30 minute discussion with us. We can talk about cybersecurity in general. We can talk about backups. We can look at data solution. If you want to look at data solution as a great backup solution, whether SaaS um, or your workstations or servers backing up those. Um, so go to nwtext.com. You can, you can book a one-on-one -on -one discussion with us. Happy to talk about your unique situation when it comes to cybersecurity. Um, no one organization is the same. Uh, every organization just has different nuances um, for how you guys manage your data and how you guys back up everything. So once again, thanks everyone for being here today. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Um, hello at nwtext.com. Uh, you'll be uh, getting an email from us with the recording um, in the next day or so. And if you have any extra questions, uh, feel free to reach out. And thanks so much for spending time with us today. Thanks again, Desiree. Um, and uh, thanks everyone. Take care and be well. Thanks for having me. Have a good day, guys.